Good evening, good morning, and good day wherever you are. Welcome to Biblical Quests. We are a worldwide scripture study community seeking to fulfill Yah's commandment to his followers to meditate on the Torah day and night so that we may be like a tree planted by streams of water that gives its fruit in its season so all that we do will prosper. This is week 22 and 23 of our 52-week cycle of chronological reading through the Torah, Prophets, and Yeshua's words, reminding you that we are currently going through year one, which means that today the deep dive will be on the Torah portion in Exodus. The reading and open discussion will explore several sources, in particular the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Septuagint, and the Hebrew-English Masoretic. Where relevant, we will also explore extra-canonical books as found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We are humbled and excited to share this journey with you all. Let us pray. Father Yah, we thank you for all that you give and all that you provide. May you guide us tonight in your spirit. May we speak through the lens of wisdom. And may you inspire those who hear and watch the videos to research your words to dig into them deeper and be moved by them. And may it become a blessing to them and for them. We ask these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Welcome everyone. Quick reminder that I dropped the PDF for tonight's study in the recordings channel. As you can see on the live stream, this is our weekly chair portion master schedule and this week we are going to cover two weeks last week and this week so it's week 22 and 23 this two weeks portion include chapters from exodus jeremiah and mark we are going to deep dive on the torah portion and we highly recommend that you would read the prophets and yeshua portion at your own leisure this week it's week 22 and 23. We are going to cover chapters, Exodus chapter 29 through 34. Let us begin. This is Exodus chapter 29. And this is the thing that you will do for them to consecrate them to serve as a priest for me. Take one young bull and two rams without defect and unleavened bread and unleavened, ring-shaped bread cakes mixed with oil, and wafers of unleavened bread smeared with oil. You will make them with finely milled wheat flour, and you will put them on one basket, and you will bring them on the basket, and bring the bull and the two rams, and you will bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of assembly, and you will wash them with water, and you will take the garments and clothe Aaron with the tunic and the robe of the ephod, and you will fasten to him the ephod and the breastpiece with the waistband of the ephod, and you will set the turban on his head, and you will put the holy diadem on the turban, and you will take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him, and you will bring his sons and clothe them with tunics, and you will gird Aaron and his sons with sashes and wrap headdresses on them, and priesthood will be theirs as a lasting rule, and you will ordain Aaron and his sons, and you will bring the bull before the tent of assembly, and Aaron and his sons will lay their hands on the head of the bull, and you will slaughter the bull before Yahweh at the entrance of the tent of assembly, and you will take some of the blood of the bull and with your finger put it on the horns of the altar, and you will pour out all the blood at the base of the altar, and you will take and turn into smoke on the altar all the fat covering the inner parts and the lobe on the liver and the two kidneys and the fat that is on them and the flesh of the bull and its skin and its offal you will burn with fire outside the camp. It is a sin offering, and you will take the one ram, and Aaron and his sons will lay their hands on the head of the ram, and you will slaughter the ram and take its blood and sprinkle it on the altar all around, and you will cut the ram into pieces and wash its inner parts, and you will put its legs with its pieces and with its head, and you will turn into smoke on the altar all of the ram. It is a burnt offering for Yahweh. It is a smell of appeasement, an offering by fire for Yahweh. And you will take the second ram, and Aaron and his sons will lay their hands on the head of the ram. And you will slaughter the ram and take some of its blood and put it on Aaron's right earlobe, and on the right earlobe of his sons, and on the thumb of their right hand, and on the big toe of their right foot. And you will sprinkle the blood at the base of the altar all around. And you will take some of the blood that is on the altar and some of the anointing oil. And you will spatter it on Aaron and on his garments and on his sons and on his sons' garments with him. And he will be sacred and his garments and his sons and his sons' garments with him. And you will take from the ram the fat and the fat tail and the fat covering the inner parts and the lobe of the liver and the two kidneys and the fat that is on them and the right thigh. 
because it is the ram of ordination, and one loaf of bread, and one ring shaped bread cake of oiled bread, and one wafer from the basket of unleavened bread that is before Yahweh. You will put them all on the palms of Aaron and on the palms of his sons, and you will wave them as a wave offering before Yahweh. And you will take them from their hand and turn them to smoke on the altar beside the burnt offering as a fragrance of appeasement before Yahweh. It is an offering made by fire before Yahweh. And you will take the breast section from the ram of ordination that is for Aaron, and you will wave it as a wave offering before Yahweh. It will be your portion, and you will consecrate the wave offering breast section and the thigh of the contribution that was waved, and that was presented from the ram of the ordination that is for Aaron and for his sons. And it will be for Aaron and for his sons as a lasting rule from the Israelites, because it is a contribution, and it will be a contribution from the Israelites from their sacrifices of fellowship their contribution to Yahweh. And the holy garments that are for Aaron will be for his sons after him in which to anoint them and to ordain them. Seven days the priest who replaces him from among his sons will wear them, who comes to the tent of assembly to serve in the sanctuary. And you will take the ram of ordination and boil its meat in a holy place. And Aaron and his sons will eat the meat of the ram and the bread that is in the basket at the entrance of the tent of assembly. And they will eat them, the things by which atonement was made for them to ordain them to consecrate them and a stranger will not eat them because they are holy objects. If any remains until morning from the ordination meat or from the bread, you will burn the remainder in fire. It will not be eaten because it is a holy object, and you will do so for Aaron and for his sons, according to all that I have commanded you. Seven days you will ordain them, and you will offer a bull for a sin offering every day for the atonement, and you will offer a sin offering on the altar when you make atonement for it, and you will anoint it to consecrate it. Seven days you will make atonement for the altar, and you will consecrate it, and the altar will be a most holy thing. Anyone who touches the altar will be holy, and this is what you shall offer on the altar, two one-year-old male lambs every day continually, the first lamb you will offer in the morning, and the second lamb you will offer at twilight, and a tenth of finely milled flour mixed with a fourth of a hin of beaten oil, and a fourth of a hin of wine as a libation with the first lamb. And the second lamb you will offer at twilight. You will offer a grain offering and its libation like that of the morning for a fragrance of appeasement, an offering made by fire for Yahweh. It will be a burnt offering of continuity throughout your generations at the entrance of the tent of assembly before Yahweh, where I will meet with you to speak to you there. And I will meet with the Israelites there, and it will be consecrated by my glory. And I will consecrate the tent of assembly and the altar. And Aaron and his sons I will consecrate to serve as priests for me. And I will dwell in the midst of the Israelites, and I will be their God. And they will know that I am Yahweh, their God, who brought them out from the land of Egypt in order to dwell in their midst. I am Yahweh, their God. Okay, thoughts and insights on chapter 29. So before I start, I just want to point out there were multiple things mentioned in this chapter, such as the consecration of priests. I'm talking about them laying their hands on the bull, the rams that were sacrificed. And then about the blood being put on the earlobe and the toe and the sprinkling of the blood to make them holy. All of these things, other people have done great work on discussing those topics. So I would say go and research into that because I'm not touching on any of these on this one. Also, something I want to point out is the priests are given a seven-day rotation. And not too many people think about that but they have a seven-day rotation of their service. And then something else interesting in here where the altar is consecrated, they take seven days atoning for the altar before it's consecrated to, mm. to make it holy before they can even use it. So that's very interesting. But what I'm going to talk about in this section is in regards to the priestly garment that was discussed here in Exodus 29, 6. And you will set the turban on his head, and you will put the holy diadem on the turban. Now the holy diadem is also known as a crown of consecration, a crown of separation, or a crown of Nazareneship, depending on how you want to look at that. All of those do fit in this type of reference. And then in Leviticus 8.9 it also talks about this, discussing the turban on his head. And he placed the turban on his head, and on the front of the turban he placed the gold rosette, the holy diadem, just as Yahweh had commanded Moses. Another interesting parallel on here is Isaiah, in verse chapter 28, verse 5, he's talking about, In that day, Yahweh of hosts will become a garland of glory and a diadem of beauty to the remnant of his people. 
Now garland and diadem are both head adornments. So Yahweh will be a head adornment of glory and beauty to the remnant of his people. Very interesting. Zechariah 9.16, And Yahweh, their God, will save them on that day as the flock of his people, for they are like the stones of a diadem glittering on his land. So Zechariah is tying in that the stones of the crown, this diadem, are reference to or like his people. So Yahweh sees his people as stones of a crown that glitter on his land. Very interesting. More on the crown. We have Proverbs 4, 7 through 9. The beginning of wisdom. Get wisdom with all that is in your possession. Gain insight. Cherish her and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. She will give a garland for your head and shall bestow a crown of glory upon you. Wisdom will do that. And if you've studied wisdom and see all of the references of having wisdom is a sign of walking in righteousness, in obedience, in humility, with the fruits of the Spirit, that is having wisdom. In Sirach 118, the fear of the Lord is a crown of wisdom, making peace and perfect health to flourish, both which are the gifts of God, and it enlarges their rejoicing that love him. So the fear of the Lord is a crown of wisdom. So if you're looking at getting wisdom, you obviously must first have the fear of the Lord to even obtain wisdom. Further on, the holy diadem, the crown of consecration. In Sirach 45, 6 through 12, Sirach also describes this scenario with Aaron the high priest and Moses with their holy garbs being put on. He exalted Aaron, a holy person like him, his brother from the tribe of Levi. He established him as an everlasting covenant and gave him a priesthood of the people. He pronounced him happy with decorum and he girded him with a robe of glory. He clothed him with perfection of boasting and he crowned him with the implements of strength, breeches and a full length robe and shoulder strap. And he encircled him with pomegranate, with very many golden bells all around, to send forth a sound at his steps, to make an audible sound in the shrine for a memorial for the sons of his people, with a sacred vestment, and that's referring to the ephod, with gold, blue, and purple, a work of an embroiderer, with the oracle of judgment, for manifestations of truth. And that's talking about the men and Thurum and Thumen. Yes, thank you. I was trying to think about how to pronounce it. <laughs> thank you. Manifestations of truth. With twisted scarlet, a work of an artisan, with costly stones, and we just talked about that, of an engraved seal in a setting of gold, a work of a jeweler, for a memorial in inscribed writing according to the number of the tribes of Israel. So once again, these stones are directly related to the tribes of Israel. We just read the stones referenced by Isaiah is his people. A crown of gold upon a turban, a carving of a seal of holiness, a boast of honor, a work of strength, objects of desire for the eyes adorned. So once again, in Sirach is describing this garment and this whole outfit in very similitude of uh, what's described in Exodus and Leviticus. Now in Sirach 6, 29 to 31, and her, this is speaking of wisdom, fetters will be a shelter of strength for you, and her collars a robe of glory, for a golden ornament is upon her, and her bonds are a blue thread. You will wear her as a robe of glory, and you will put her on like a garland of joy. So here, wisdom is a shelter of strength. You're protected and her robe is of glory. The words being used to describe wisdom is like a robe that protects and it's a robe of glory and that her bonds are a blue thread, which is very interesting, so interesting. that it's a blue thread because I'm going to touch on that on the, on the next one. Yeah, You will wear her as a robe of glory and a garland of joy. And a garland is once again a head adornment of joy. Tying in wisdom is definitely 
part of the priestly outfit is that this priesthood has wisdom and they must have wisdom in order to walk in holiness. Exodus 28, 21. The stones will be according to the names of the Israelites, 12 according to their names with seal engravings, each according to its name. They will be for the 12 tribes. Once again, Exodus expounds further that these stones are specifically the names of the tribes. Further, Exodus 28, 36 through 37, and you will make a pure gold rosette and you will engrave on it the seal engravings, a holy object for Yahweh, and you will place it on a blue cord and it will be on the turban at the front of the turban it will be. Why a blue cord is being used here, you ask? Let's look. Exodus 28, 28. And they will tie the breast piece by its rings to the ring of the ephod with a blue cord to be on the waistband of the ephod and the breast piece will not come loose from the ephod. So we see this blue cord is tying everything on his outfit together. So the breast piece holds the 12 stones. The ephod is the royal tunic of red, blue, and purple with gold leaves that is over the blue robe of righteousness. So you're, you're picturing all of this garb and blue robe and the thread that holds all of the pieces together on this blue robe is blue cords. Numbers 15, 38 to 39. Speak to the Israelites and tell them to make for themselves tassels on the hems of their garments throughout their generations and to put a blue cord on the tassel of the hem. You will have a tassel for you to look at and remember all the commandments of Yahweh and do them and not follow after the unfaithfulness of your own heart and eyes. The blue cord ties us to Yah and his commands. So it's very important, this whole picture of the outfit with the blue cord tying us all, it, it's basically the commands of obedience is tied all of these garment pieces together as one. And it also represents wisdom in the same process. So it's a, just a beautiful picture about it. Okay. I just wanted to mention that the word that is used for blue in Hebrew is trelet. And trelet is not an ordinary blue. It's basically sky blue or baby blue, I think. Really? Yeah. I, someone had told me it was like a more of a, almost a purple blue, like no, darker. No, it's sky blue. It's very light blue. So, well, I guess... Like, I think it, here you call it baby blue. Okay, so the so, color I made it on the, yeah, on the slide looks yeah, pretty good. <laughs> exactly. That's what trelet is. The yeah, color that, that, color? that you will use for the slide. Perfect. Yeah. All right, right, and lastly, I just wanted to touch on this because I, I felt like this tied in. In Genesis 38, 18, I want to talk about the seal, the cord, and the staff that Judah had re regarding Tamar. And he said, what is the pledge that I must give to you? Him talking to Tamar. And she said, your seal, your cord, and your staff that is in your hand. And he gave them to her and went into her and she could see by him. The seal, why does he have a seal? Because as we just read, the seal represents that he is an Israelite. The cord the cord represents that he lives by the Torah in righteousness. Wow, that's amazing. The staff, he shepherds and teaches others the way of Yahweh. It's an amazing representation wow. of why he has these things because and, he and, is. And it just shows again that they already knew the commandments. <laughs> you exactly. Know, and they were, <laughs> because yes. yeah, these things represented something and yeah. they knew. Wow. Beautiful. Okay. Yeah. This is Exodus chapter 30, and you will make an altar for burning incense. You will make it of acacia wood, a cubit its length and a cubit its width. It will be square, and two cubits its height, its horns of one piece with it. And you will overlay it with pure gold, its top and its sides all around and its horns. And you will make for it a gold molding all around, and you will make two gold rings for it. Under its molding on two opposite sides, you will make them as holders for poles to carry it with them. You will make the poles of acacia wood, and you will overlay them with gold. And you will put it before the curtain that is upon the Ark of the Testimony, before the atonement cover, which is on the testimony, there where I will meet with you, and on it Aaron will turn fragrant incense into smoke. Each morning when he tends the lamps, he will turn it into smoke. And when Aaron sets up the lamps at twilight, he will turn it into smoke, incense of continuity. 
before Yahweh throughout your generations. You will not offer on it strange incense or a burnt offering or a grain offering, and you will not pour a libation on it. And Aaron will make atonement on its horns one time in the year from the blood of the sin offering of the atonement. One time in the year he will make atonement on it throughout your generations. It is a most holy thing for Yahweh. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, When you take a census of the Israelites to count them, they will each give the ransom of his life for Yahweh when counting them. And a plague will not be among them when counting them. This they will give everyone who is counted, the half shekel, according to the sanctuary shekel, which is twenty jerahs per shekel. The half shekel is a contribution for Yahweh. Everyone who is counted from twenty years old and above will give the contribution of Yahweh. The rich will not give more, and the poor will not give less than the half shekel to give the contribution of Yahweh to make atonement for their lives. And you will take the atonement money from the Israelites and give it to the service of the tent of assembly. And it will be as a memorial for the Israelites before Yahweh to make atonement for your lives. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, And you will make a basin of bronze and its bronze stand for washing, and you will put it between the tent of assembly and the altar. And you will put water there, and Aaron and his sons will wash their hands and their feet with it. When they come to the tent of assembly, they will wash with water so that they do not die. Or when they approach the altar to serve by turning to smoke an offering made by fire to Yahweh, and they will wash their hands and their feet so that they do not die, and it will be a lasting rule for them, to him and to his offspring throughout their generations. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, And take for yourself top quality balsam oils, five hundred shekels of flowing myrrh, half as much, two hundred and fifty shekels of fragrant cinnamon, and two hundred and fifty shekels of fragrant reed, and five hundred shekels of kasha, according to the sanctuary shekel, and a hin of olive oil, and you will make it into holy anointing oil, a spice blend of a fragrant ointment, the work of a perfumer. It will be holy anointing oil, and you will anoint with it the tent of assembly, and the ark of the testimony, and the table, and all its equipment, and the lampstand, and its equipment, and the incense altar, and the altar of burnt offering, and all its equipment, and the basin, and its stand. And you will consecrate them, and they will be most holy things. Anyone who touches them will be holy. And you will anoint Aaron and his sons, and you will consecrate them to serve as priests for me. And you will speak to the Israelites, saying, This will be my holy anointing oil throughout your generations. It will not be poured on human flesh, and with its measurements you will not make any like it. It is holy. It will be holy to you. Anyone who compounds perfume like it and who puts it on a stranger will be cut off from his people. And Yahweh said to Moses, Take for yourself fragrant perfumes, stacky resin and onagea and galbanum, fragrant perfumes and pure frankincense, an equal part of each, and make it into a compound of incense, the work of a perfumer, salted, pure, holy, and you will grind part of it to powder, and you will put part of it before the testimony in the tent of assembly where I will meet with you. It will be a most holy thing to you, and the incense that you will make with its measurements you will not make for yourselves. It will be holy to you for Yahweh. Anyone who makes any like it to smell it will be cut off from his people. Before we switch to discussing our insights, I wanted to remind those of you who haven't joined our study last week that whenever you see in the English translation bronze, B-R-O-N-Z-E, or brass, B-R-A-S, my accent, okay, bronze or brass, just know that in Hebrew it's actually copper, okay? So all of the equipment and the, the entire foundation of the tabernacle and the, the, the tools, anything to do with all of the holy tools, it's either gold, silver, or copper, okay? It's always pure, and it's always one of those three precious metals. It's definitely not bronze or brass. Highly conductive. So just, I just want you to realize it. Okay, thoughts and insights on chapter 30. Being a naturopath and also a clinical aromatherapist, you can guess how excited I was to read the formulas, the recipes that Yah gave Moses. I just want to spend a little bit time on those. The holy anointing oil, there are two recipes here. The first one is the holy anointing oil. Here are the verses 23 through 33. And take for yourself top, top quality balsam oils, those are the essential oils, 500 shekels of flowing mirror, half as much, 250 shekels of fragrant cinnamon and 250 shekels of fragrant reed sweet calamus. 
and 500 shekels of cassia according to the sanctuary shekel and a hin of olive oil and you will make it into a holy anointing oil a spice blend of a fragrant ointment the work of a perfumer in hebrew the word that is used is which means compound or a pharmacist okay it will be holy anointing oil and you will anoint with it the tent of assembly and the ark of the testimony and the table and all of its equipment and the lampstand and its equipment and the incense altar and the altar of burnt offering and all its equipment and the basin and its stand and you will consecrate them and they will be most holy things anyone who touches them will be holy and you will anoint Aaron and his sons and you will consecrate them to serve as priests for me and you will speak to the Israelites saying this will be my holy anointing oil throughout your generations it will not be poured on human flesh and with its measurements you will not make any like it it is holy, it will be holy to you. Anyone who compounds perfume like it and who puts it on a stranger will be cut off from his people. The first essential oil blend that Yah is instructing Moses to prepare. The ingredients include the essential oil of myrrh, essential oil of cinnamon leaf, essential oil of sweet calamus and then essential oil of cassia which is basically cinnamon bark the cinnamon tree there are two ways of getting essential oils from it once uh, one way is the leaf and one way is the bark okay so we are using the two parts of the tree and then the carrier oil for this formula is olive oil what is the use of this Basically, it's used to anoint, consecrate the tent of assembly, the ark of the testimony, the ta table and its equipment, lampstand and equipment, incense, altar of burnt offering and its equipment, basin, and also Aaron and his sons to serve as priests for Yah. So this is an anointing, consecrating oil. And what are the warnings attached to this recipe? Number one, it is holy. Two, it will not be poured on human flesh other than Aaron and his sons. Three, with its measurements, you will not make any like it. Four, anyone who compounds this recipe and put, puts it on a stranger will be cut off from his people. So basically, even though we are given the recipe, we are not supposed to prepare it. And I have to tell you that even before I came back to Torah and yeah, I, and I am an avid aromatherapist and I have my own formulas and I've always looked at that formula and I never dared compounding it because the warning is very clear. We are not supposed to compound it ourselves. I just wanted to explain a little bit more about the different essential oils and I think there is a big reason why Yah chose those essential oils, okay? So I'm not going to go in depth even though I put a lot of information here but all of this is information is for you later to go back to this presentation and learn a little bit more about the oils but they are really and it's an amazing combination of oil. So first of all, Mir is known first and foremost to be an, a potent antibacterial and antifungal. It's amazing for oral health, skin health. It's powerful anti-inflammatory. It's one of the st strongest uh, antioxidant on the planet, okay? If you compare it to, for example, to goji berries on the ORAC uh, measurement scale, there is no comparison. And goji berries are supposed to be the most uh, antioxidant fruit. Okay? It's almost 100 times more. Uh, it's it just non-comparable. Okay, It's detoxifier, it's a liver tonic, and it's also a powerful decon. The next oil in the formula, cinnamon bark, potent antibacterial and antifungal. I also included some links to studies. It's disinfectant and preservative. It lowers blood sugar, it's a potent antioxidant and heart tonic. It's a brain tonic also. And I included some studies on this. And then it's also good for oral health. 
and then cinnamon leaf it's mainly an, a, a painkiller or analgesic it's also antiseptic and antispasmodic and the calamus the oil of calamus nourishes and support the central nervous system and brain uh, it's phenomenal oil for the nervous system it's also anti-aromatic, anti-arthritic, anti-spasmodic, and antibiotic. Okay, so you can see that there is there, there are a, a few common denominators between the oils. Almost all of them are antibacterial and antifungal, mm -hmm. and and uh, almost all of them are antispasmodic and also are very supporting for the brain and the nervous system. The next formula is the formula for the ketoret or the holy incense. And this one are the verses 34 through 38. And Yahweh said to Moses, take for yourself fragrant perfumes against essential oils and onica and galbanum, fragrant perfumes and pure frankincense and equal part of each and make it into a compound of incense the work of a perfumer again compounder or pharmacist salted pure holy and you will grind it into powder and you will put it before the testimony in the tent of assembly where i will meet with you it will be most holy thing to you and the incense that you will make with its measurement you will not make for yourself it will be holy to you for yahweh anyone who makes any like it to smell it will be cut off from his people. So let's look at this formula. So this formula has four ingredients in it. Stuck the resin. This is an unknown resin. No one knows what it is. Onika was actually prized aromatic in biblical time. It is debated whether it refers to a shellfish or a plant. I promise you it's not shellfish, okay? The great Jewish scholar Rashi suggested that Onika is a kind of root, while the Talmud states it came from an annual plant. Some believe that Styrax benzoin may be the plant source for Onika. Like frankincense and myrrh, benzoin is resin. Onika was traditionally known for its comforting and soothing properties, as well as its benefits for the skin. And she and people used it to improve complexion and to help nourish the skin. Perhaps some of the beneficial aspects of the benzoin were due to not only the oil itself, but also the other oils compounded with it. And then gal galban galbanum and frankincense. Uh, the use of this is for the incense altar. And the warnings that come with this recipe is it is holy. With its measurement, you will not make any like it for yourself. Anyone who compounds perfume like it to smell it will be cut off from his people. So again, very stern warning here. So I'm just going to touch on two essential oils in this formula, galbanum and frankincense. Fran galbanum is a really amazing oil because it's one of the only very few essential oils that are completely safe to use while pregnant or nursing. It stimulates blood cir circulation, it's antispasmodic, it's decongestant, detoxifies the body, it's insect repellent, antiparasitic, and it also speeds up healing. And frankincense i refer to frankincense as the king of all essential oils okay and i just included here two pictures from the national Lab library of medicine just showing you i just did a search on just the word frankincense and i came up with 1043 results all of these results are basically scientific studies on essential oil of frankincense it's really mind-blowing about how much science there is behind frankincense for different medical purposes but of course no one is using it because you cannot patent and make trillions of dollars on it I also did another ser search, frankincense and cancer, and I came up with 172 results. Those are scientific studies that, again, are mind-blowing about certain cancers, such as carcinoma, that frankincense kills those cancer cells. 
and when I turn off the recording, if you remember, remind me to tell you a personal story about frankincense, okay? Personal testimonial. So frankincense, it helps reduce stress reaction and negative emotions. I included links to studies here. It helps boost immune system function and prevents illness. It also helps fight cancers and deal with chemotherapy side effects. It's astringent and can kill harmful germs and bacteria. It protects the skin, prevents signs of aging, improves memory, and helps decrease inflammation and pain. And I included the link to a, an, a, a very nice article by Dr. Josh X that you can refer to to read more about frankincense. But what I notice about the ctorate is that mainly it's more around relaxing and also boosting the brain. And there is also the antibacterial thing again. The antibacterial team is going through the anointing oil and the incense, the holy incense. So anyway, I just wanted to share all of this because I it's my passion and I got really excited seeing those recipes. Yeah, those are great insights. I appreciate the dive on that and, yeah. and sharing and seeing that and a better understanding what was the ingredients and all of the, I guess you could say, health benefits to them and antibacterial use, obviously, mm -hmm. for them to use it in, in the holy place. So that's, that's great. The, the only thing I wanted to add on this chapter that I saw that was interesting, I didn't get to touch on, but it was on verse 12, each give a ransom of his life. Those that were 20, uh, 20 and up when they did the the count of the, of the people. Yeah. And they would each give a ransom of their life. So once again, we see that there's always some type of ransom, especially when it talks about the firstborn. But what's interesting is that whenever there is a, a thread, a theme, a common theme in the Bible, not only here, but also in the book of Kings, where leaders were not supposed to do a census, and they only if Yah asked them to do a census, they were allowed to do it. And then if Yah asked them and they did it, still people had to give a ransom. And I never understood that concept. It's really a, a mysterious concept for me. Why Yah did not like to do a census, and then whenever they did a census, to they had to do a run to to give a ransom. But you know, okay, well, next time we come across it, I'll, we need I'll, to, I'll do a dive on it. Yeah, but you will see it that whenever they do, a, for example, when King David one time did a census without right. Yah's blessing, yeah. he was punished, and and there was a plague. Okay, so let us continue chapter thirty one. This is Exodus chapter 31. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel the son of Uri, the son of Hur, from the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom and with skill and with knowledge and with every kind of craftsmanship, to devise designs, to work with gold and with silver and with bronze, and in stone cutting for setting and in cutting wood, for doing every kind of craftsmanship. And, look, I have given with him Oholiab the son of Ahasamach, from the tribe of Dan. And I have put skill in the heart of all the skilled of heart, and they will make all that I have commanded you, the tent of assembly, and the ark of the testimony, and the atonement cover that is on it, and all the equipment of the tent, and the table and all its equipment, and the pure gold lampstand and all its equipment, and the incense altar, and the altar of burnt offering and all its equipment, and the basin and its stand, and the garments of woven material, and the garments of the sanctuary for Aaron the priest, and the garments of his sons to serve as priests, and the anointing oil and the fragrant incense for the sanctuary, according to all that I have commanded you, they will make it. And Yahweh spoke to Moses and said, And you speak to the Israelites, saying, Surely you must keep my Sabbaths, because it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, in order to know that I am Yahweh, who consecrates you. And you must keep the Sabbath, because it is holy for you. The filers of it will surely be put to death. Because anyone who does work on it, that person will be cut off from among his people. On six days work can be done, and on the seventh is a Sabbath of complete rest, a holy day for Yahweh. Anyone doing work on the Sabbath day will surely be put to death. The Israelites will pay attention to the Sabbath in order to fulfill the Sabbath throughout their generations as a lasting covenant. It is a sign between me and the Israelites forever. Because in six days Yahweh made the heavens and the earth 
And on the seventh he ceased and recovered. And when he finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave to Moses the two tablets of the testimony, stone tablets, written with the finger of God. Okay, chapter 31, Thoughts and Insights. I wanted to share an excerpt for a large presentation that I'm, I've been working for a while now. It's called Moadim, and I'm doing a deep dive throughout the Bible on the Moadim. It's going to be a really good one, but I took an excerpt about the, a few slides about Sh Shabbat. So he says, surely you must keep my Shabbat. And I just wanted to talk about it a little bit. Verses 13 through 17, he says, And you speak to the Israelites, saying, Surely you must keep my Shabbat, because it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, in order to know that I am Yahweh who consecrate you. And you must keep the Shabbat, because it is holy for you. Defilers of it will surely be put to death, because anyone who does work on it, that person will be cut off from among his people. On six days work can be done, and on the seventh is a Shabbat of complete rest, a holy day for Yahweh. Anyone doing work on the Shabbat day will surely be put to death. The Israelites will pay attention to the Shabbat in order to fulfill the Shabbat throughout their generations as a lasting covenant. It is a sign between me and the Israelites forever, because in six days Yahweh made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh he ceased and recovered. So I put here a list of from the canonized Bible, all of the references to the Shabbat commandment, just for your personal uh, journey, you can refer to these slides. These are all of the references from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Kings, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Nehemiah, and Second Chronicles. Also, I put references from Jubilees. So these are the Dead Sea Scroll additional scripture references. Jubilees also has quite a bit of references to this commandment. When I literally took a magnifying glass and I went through all of those references and I organized all of them and I read all of them and analyzed them, this is what I came up with. I came up with a list of do's and don't, don't. So the do's, the list of do is prepare the Shabbat needs ahead of time purification before sunset the day before and staying away from impurity be holy in body and mind be holy in thoughts words and actions it is preferable to have a roasted meat meal on mikra kodesh days and shabbat is considered mikra kodesh Declaration of holiness, holy assembly, public gathering to sanctify the day with prayer, praise of Yah, joy, festive meal, meat and wine, and study of scripture. Blow the trumpets or the shofar, and it shall be to you for a memorial before your God. So we are supposed to blow the shofar on Shabbat. Enjoy, delight, rest, eat and drink. Be happy and grateful to Yah. Bless Yah for giving us the Shabbat. So this is the list of do's. The list of don't. Do not do work or exert efforts in the three plans of existence. Thinking, not thinking and planning it, not talking about it and not doing it. Okay, so it's not enough not doing the work. We shouldn't even think about it or plan it or talk about it, okay? And it reminds me of the Sermon on the Mount when Yeshua said, it is said that you should not uh, do this, but I'm telling you, you shouldn't even think about it. So it reminded me of this. Oh, yeah. Do not exert yourself physically. Do not light a fire. Do not cook or bake. Do not do things that can be done on a weekday. Do not 
uh, defile a holy day with any uncleanness or impurity. Do not speak anything bad or anything far from holy, such as cursing and slurring lips. Do not go on a journey, travel at sea. Do not ride an animal. Do not walk the land. Do not carry a burden or on a person or animal. Do not catch, hunt, fish, and slaughter animals. Do not fast. Do not go to war. Do not fight. Do not mourn, be sad or cry, and do not have sex on Shabbat. And then Shabbat is given for anyone who elects to walk with Yah and keep his covenant, Israelites and Gentiles alike. The Gentiles who choose to keep the covenant and observe Shabbat, a place of honor is carved among his people. So look at the Isaiah 56, 1 through 8. Observe justice and do righteousness, for my salvation is close to coming and my justice to being revealed. Happy is the man who does this and the son of humankind who keeps hold of it, who keeps the Shabbat so as not to profane it, and who keeps his hand from doing any evil. And do not let the foreigner who joins himself to Yahweh say, Surely Yahweh will separate me from his people. And do not let the eunuch say, Look, I am a dry tree. For thus says Yahweh to the eunuchs who keep my Shabbat and choose that, that in which I delight and who keep hold of my covenant. And I will give them a monument and a name in my house and within my walls better than sons and daughters. I will give him an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And the foreigners who join themselves to Yahweh to serve him and to love the name of Yahweh, to become his servants, everyone who keeps the Shabbat so as not to profane it and those who keep hold of my covenant, I will bring them to my holy mountain. I will make them merry in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called the house of prayer for all peoples. Declares the Lord Yahweh who gathers the scattered ones of Israel. Still I will gather to him to his gathered ones. And last, this is an excerpt from Jubilees uh, about Shabbat. Six days I will, uh, six days will you labor, but the seven days the Shabbat of Yah your Elohim. You shall do no manner of work in it, you and your sons and your men servants and your maiden servants and all your cattle and travelers also who lodge with you. So no one is supposed to do work, including your employees and contractors, servants and animals. No one is supposed to work. The man that does any work on it shall die. Whoever desecrates that day, whoever has sex with his wife, whoever says he will do something on it, or he that will set out on a journey on it in regard to any buying or selling, or whoever draws water on it which he had not prepared for himself on the sixth day, and whoever takes up any burden to carry it out of his tent or out of his house shall die. You shall do no work whatsoever on the Shabbat day except what you have prepared for yourself on the sixth day. So as to eat and drink and rest, keep Shabbat free from all work on that day. It is to bless Yah your Elohim who has given you a day of festival and a pure day and a day of the pure kingdom. This is a day for Israel among all their days forever. Great is the honor which Yah has given to Israel that they should eat, drink and be satisfied on this festival day. Rest on it from all labor which belongs to the labor of the children of men, except burning frankincense and bringing offerings and sacrifices before Yah for days and for Shabbat. Only this work shall be done on Shabbat day in the sanctuary of Yah, your Elohim, so that they may atone for Israel with sacrifice continually from day to day for a memorial pleasing before Yah, so that he may always receive them from day to day according to what you have been commanded. Every man who does any work on it or takes a trip or tills his farm, whether in his house or in 
or any other place and whoever lights a fire or rides a beast or travels by sheep on the sea shall die and whoever strikes or kills anything or slaughters a beast or a bird or whoever catches an animal or a bird or a fish or whoever fasts or makes war on the Shabbat the man who does any of these things on the Shabbat shall die this is done so that the children of Israel will observe the Shabbat according to the commandments regarding the Shabbat of the land. It is written in the tablets which he gave into my hands that I should write out for you the laws of the season and the seasons according to the division of their days. We are opening the floor if anyone has any comments or any questions about the first three chapters for tonight. I have a quick thing, comment. Yes. You know, during the time of the Maccabees, there was a sect of Jews that were slaughtered on a Sabbath because they wouldn't protect their camp. Do you know the one I'm talking about? I do. I remember it. And I'm like, it, it, and Judas Maccabees were like, we're not going to be like that. We're fighting. If we're attacked, we're going to protect ourselves. So like, that's in Maccabees. That commandment to not make war... So if you don't protect yourself, your camp gets annihilated. Yes, so... That doesn't seem right. Yes, so we are talking about initiating war on Shabbat or right. actively pursuing war. But Defend if you're defending yourself, definitely it's always your health and being surpasses anything else, all right? If you're about to be killed, definitely you need to defend yourself. They were saying that if they didn't defend themselves, there was no war. You know what I'm, not, you know what I'm saying? Like, you can just come in and annihilate us. We're, there is no war because we're not defending ourselves. Like, it's that mentality that just scares me to death with people is that they won't defend themselves because they take these rules or these commands yeah. and, and they don't use them with any common sense in my view. Yeah. But you know how you can see why they did it because they're like, if we don't defend ourselves, there's no war. Yeah, I understand and I agree with you and I think I need to look for a verse in support of the fact that if we are talking about a matter of life and death, like a matter of life and death supersede... Yeah, life of the death. law in that sense yeah. because it's a life. And remember Yeshua talking to the Pharisee about, mm -hmm. do you not pull your donkey out of the ditch or just let it die if it's on a Shabbat? Not yeah. only this, he was healing on Shabbat. And yeah, and they were mad. Because that's the point he was trying to make, that the, in a matter of life and death, life takes its seat. Yeah, yeah. It, it supersedes the law because there is always levels or degrees in it where you have a law, but the law can be superseded when it is of righteous action. Yeah. It's like the, okay, perfect, thanks, I'll just let you go. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Any other comments? Yeah, I have a comment about the frankincense and, and all the um, essential oils. I think it's brilliant because I, too, really have always been needed essential oils. And it makes a lot of sense when you lay them out to see exactly what they were used for. Because if they're being burned inside the tabernacle, it makes sense that it would stop it from having the antioxidant to just so mold would grow or just like any yes. time they were wandering in the desert. I thought that by breaking them down like that was really good to help give you a bigger picture of what each kind of essential oil does. And it makes a lot of sense being inside the tabernacle and that it would stop a lot of these things from happening. And I was interested though, when it was talking about, about something for pain, I was wondering, like, it, because you know how when the, the high priest would be able to go in and the priest were in, into the holy place. Yes. If that was not, you know how they couldn't have anything unclean or anything, like any type of sore or anything. I was, it made me think to myself when you had said that about the pain, that it would um, seem like it, they would almost cure them going into that environment. I don't know. It was just was a thought. Yeah. I, I felt like... What I saw a combination of, first of all, disinfecting the entire environment because they had to anoint all of the equipment, everything with that oil, meaning they were disinfecting everything. The altars, the table, the, everything was disinfectant with those oils. So 
I saw that one and then I saw the fact that there is a lot to do with the brain and the nervous system and I thought this is a very stressful job especially whenever he went into the holy of holies not knowing if he will survive it that could cause a lot of anxiety so I saw a lot of the formula definitely had ingredients that I would put in an anti-anxiety formula okay I could see how Yam was proactively taking care of their nervous system because naturally they, they might have a little bit anxiety having that role. And the last thing that I saw is that Ya was also proactively supporting their brain and cognitive abilities. Yeah, so those are brilliant, very short recipes, but very powerful. Okay, any other comments before we continue? just want to say thank you so much for all that deep dive to the Frankenstein's all of it that you put in there because I just find that so very interesting and, and all of their uses and the anointing oil and then the Frankenstein. It was a Frankenstein's that was the oil before the arthritis and my mother has arthritis. Yeah, the so Gambano, the yes, yeah. Yeah, and think about it, they were on their feet the whole day for seven days in a row. So that also probably helped them proactively yes. stay on their feet. And yeah, it's just, it's an amazing formula. Yeah, it's interesting how the people would work six days and have one day of legitimate rest. The priests would work seven days and then they would rotate. Yeah. It reminds me of like the firefighters. The firefighters are on for so many days and off and so forth, but... Yeah, the priests had a different schedule than everyone else, and mm -hmm. there was a higher demand for them. Yeah. Yep. Good. So I encourage all of you to go back and read the details because I cruised through them very quickly, and I put some links, and yeah, those are very powerful essential oils. Okay, so let's uh, continue with chapter 32. This was Exodus chapter 32. And the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, and the people gathered opposite Aaron. And they said to him, Come, make for us gods who will go before us, because this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring it to me. And all the people took off the rings of gold that were on their ears and brought it to Aaron. And he took from their hand, and he shaped it with a tool, and he made it a cast image bull calf. And they said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. And Aaron saw, and he built an altar before it. And Aaron called, and he said, A feast for Yahweh tomorrow. And they started early the next day, and they offered burnt offerings, and they presented fellowship offerings. And the people sat to eat and drink, and they rose up to revel. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, Go down, because your people behaved corruptly, whom you brought up from the land of Egypt. They have turned aside quickly from the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a cast image bull calf, and they bowed to it, and they sacrificed to it. And they said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. And Yahweh said to Moses, I have seen this people, and, indeed, they are a stiff-necked people. And now leave me alone so that my anger may blaze against them, and let me destroy them, and I will make you into a great nation. And Moses implored Yahweh his God, and he said, Why, Yahweh, should your anger blaze against your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt with great power and with a strong hand? Why should the Egyptians say, With evil intent he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and wipe them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger and relent concerning the disaster for your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by yourself. And you told them, I will multiply your offspring like the stars of the heavens, and all this land that I promised I will give to your offspring, and they will inherit it forever. And Yahweh relented concerning the disaster that he had threatened to do to his people. And Moses turned and went down from the mountain, and the two tablets of the testimony were in his hand, tablets written on their two sides, on the front and on the back they were written, and the tablets, they were the work of God, and the writing, it was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. And Joshua heard the sound of the people in their shouting, and he said to Moses, A sound of war is in the camp. But he said, There is not a sound of shouting of victory, and there is not a sound of shouting of defeat. I hear a sound of singing. And as he came near to the camp, he saw the bull calf and dancing, and Moses became angry, and he threw the tablets from his hand, and he broke them under the mountain. And he took the bull calf that they had made, and he burned it with the fire, and he crushed it until it became fine. 
and he scattered it on the surface of the water, and he made the Israelites drink. And Moses said to Aaron, What did this people do to you that you brought on them such a great sin? And Aaron said, Let not my Lord become angry. You yourself know the people, that they are intent on evil. And they said to me, Make for us gods who will go before us, because this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And I said to them, Whoever has gold, take it off. And they gave it to me, and I threw it in the fire, and out came this bull calf. And Moses saw the people, that they were running wild, because Aaron had allowed them to run wild, for a laughingstock among their enemies. And Moses stood at the entrance of the camp, and he said, Whoever is for Yahweh, to me, and all the sons of Levi were gathered to him. And he said to them, Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, put each his sword on his side, go back and forth from gate to gate in the camp, and kill each his brother and each his friend and each his close relative. And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and from the people on that day about three thousand persons fell. And Moses said, You are ordained today for Yahweh, because each has been against his son and against his brother, and so bringing on you today a blessing. And the next day Moses said to the people, You have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up to Yahweh. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. And Moses returned to Yahweh, and he said, Alas, this people has sinned a great sin and made for themselves gods of gold. And now if you will forgive their sin, and if not, please blot me from your scroll that you have written. And Yahweh said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him from my scroll. And now go, lead the people to where I spoke to you. Look, my angel will go before you, and on the day when I punish, I will punish them for their sin. And Yahweh afflicted the people because they had made the bull calf that Aaron had made. Okay, thoughts and insights on chapter 32. Yeah, I love Aaron's response. He took the gold, he threw it in the fire, and out came this calf. <laughs> yeah, the classic. No. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, another interesting thing was when God was talking with Moses, he, he said, your people. Yeah, I know. <laughs> the tune brought out of yeah. each sheep, all of a sudden. Yeah. So, he wasn't too happy with him. That's for sure. <laughs> I know, I know. I, know. I also laughed uh, to myself when I saw those. Uh, yeah. And okay. one other thing people, a lot of people don't realize is Joshua was, was with him. Was, yeah. Was with Moses, Moshe. All right, so I want to talk about the golden calf. In Exodus 32, 1, And the people saw Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, and the people gathered opposite Aaron, and they said to him, Come, make for us gods who will go before us, because this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what became of him. In verse 4, And he took from their hand, and he shaped it with a tool, and he made it a cast image bull calf. And they said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. We see this later that this is one of Aaron's great sins that he, he gets punished for. And then Psalms 106.20 talking about this event. And so they exchange their glory for an image of an ox that eats grass. And I included a picture here of the movie from the Ten Commandments that's recognizable. Next, in Exodus 32.25-29, And Moses saw the people, and they were running wild because Aaron had allowed them to run wild. And this goes back to the authority. I believe Aaron was in fear of his life from the people. And so he went along with it instead of standing his ground and, and letting the chips fall where they were and not trusting him. And trusting him. For the laughing stop among their enemies. And Moses stood at the entrance of the camp and he said, Whoever is for Yahweh to me. And all the sons of Levi were gathered to him. And he said to them, Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, put each his sword on his side, go back and forth from gate to gate in the camp, and kill each his brother and each his friend and each his close relative. And the sons of Levi did according to the words of Moses, and from the people on that day about 3,000 persons fell. And Moses said, You are ordained today for Yahweh, because each has been against his son and against his brother, and so bringing on you today a blessing. We see something similar to this in Matthew 10, 34-39. Do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. This is Yeshua. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and the enemies of a man will be the members of his household. The one who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And the one who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. 
And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. The one who finds his life will lose it, and the one who loses his life because of me will find it. So Yeshua is basically saying the same thing here, that the people put this God before Yahweh, and it was relatives that were doing this. And here Yeshua is saying a very similar thing, that you don't put your parents ahead of me, you don't put your children ahead of me. I've seen this happen with people. They pour their life, their energy, everything. It's like their child. They worship everything about their child and so forth. Everything they do, they talk about. They take them everywhere. They, It's become an idol. And people have to be very careful with that. It says always Yah first and then family, etc. I wanted to pull that together because I thought it was very similar to what was going on here in Exodus. Now, this is the gold idol dust test. Is how I see this. Exodus 32, 20. And he took the bull calf that they had made and he burnt it with fire and he crushed it until it became fine and he scattered it on the surface of the water and he made the Israelites drink. The remaining he put in the stream flowing down the mountain. And that's in Deuteronomy 9, 21. So in Sirach 2, 3 through 5, it says, cleave unto him and depart not, that you may be increased at your later end. Accept whatever is brought upon you and be long-suffering when you pass into humiliation. For gold is tried in the fire and acceptable men in the furnace of humiliation. So here it's, it's tying in gold is, a, is tried in the fire. This bull calf was melted down, solidified, and then they ground that down into fine powder and then he put it in the water for them to drink. Why? Because I believe Moses was doing something that's similar in Numbers 5, 11 through 31 where we read a woman that's suspected of adultery. And what did they do? They were committing adultery with another god. Mm -hmm. They were doing the same thing spiritually. They were committing adultery with God, with another God they were worshiping. So a woman suspected of adultery is given a mixture of water and the dust, and that's from the dust of the altar area of the priest, that's mixed to drink that calls a visible manifestation of her guilt. So if she's guilty, there's a visible manifestation of her guilt. And I believe we went over this in Deuteronomy, where the manifestation, I theorize, was that if she committed adultery, she had an embryo within her. And that swelling of her, it says thighs, mm -hmm. I'm thinking it's swelling and basically aborted it or something. Something to that effect is and what I thought. Caused, it caused a miscarriage. Correct. Thinking. That's the way I interpreted mm -hmm. it. Not to say that's true, yeah. but that's the way I interpret it. It's a manifestation of her guilt. The connection between idolatry and adultery is throughout the scriptures. So I believe that he did this so that there would be a manifestation so that when the Levites went throughout the camp, they could tell wow. who to kill. Wow, that's brilliant. Yes. Okay, yep, really good. Okay, so let's continue to chapter 33 and then 34. This is Exodus chapter 33. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, Go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up from the land of Egypt, to the land that I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your offspring, and I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, and the Hittites, and the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, because you are a stiff-necked people, lest I destroy you on the way. And the people heard this troubling word, and they mourned, and they each did not put their ornaments on themselves. And Yahweh said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, You are a stiff-necked people. If one moment I were to go up among you, I would destroy you, and now take down your ornaments from on you, and I will decide what I will do to you. And the Israelites stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onward, and Moses took the tent and pitched it outside the camp far from the camp, and he called it the tent of assembly. And all seeking Yahweh would go out to the tent of assembly, which was outside the camp. And at the going out of Moses to the tent, all the people would rise and stand, each at the opening of his tent, and gaze after Moses until his entering the tent. And at the entering of Moses into the tent, the column of cloud would descend and stand at the opening of the tent. And he would speak with Moses, and all the people would see the column of cloud standing at the opening of the tent, and all the people would rise and bow and worship. 
each at the opening of his tent. And Yahweh would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his neighbor, and he would return to the camp. And his assistant Joshua the son of Nun, a young man, did not leave the middle of the tent. And Moses said to Yahweh, See, you are saying to me, Take this people up. But you have not let me know whom you will send with me. And you yourself have said, I know you by name. And you also have found favor in my eyes. And now if I have found favor in your eyes, make known to me, please, your way. And so I may know you so that I can find favor in your eyes. And see that this nation is your people. And he said, My presence will go, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, If your presence is not going, do not bring us up from here. And by what will it be known then that I have found favor in your eyes, I and your people? Is it not by your going with us? And so we will be distinguished, I and your people, from all the people who are on the face of the ground. And Yahweh said to Moses, Also I will do this thing that you have spoken, because you have found favor in my eyes, and I have known you by name. And he said, Please show me your glory. And he said, I myself will cause all my goodness to pass over before you, and I will proclaim the name of Yahweh before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show compassion to whom I will show compassion. But he said, You are not able to see my face, because a human will not see me alive. And Yahweh said, There is a place with me, and you will stand on the rock. And when my glory passes over, I will put you in the rock's crevice, and I will cover you with my hand until I pass over. And I will remove my hand, and you will see my back, but my face will not be visible. This is Exodus chapter 34. And Yahweh said to Moses, Cut for yourself two stone tablets like the first ones, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. And be ready for the morning, and go up in the morning to Mount Sinai, and present yourself to me there on the top of the mountain. And no one will go up with you, and neither let anyone be seen on all the mountain, nor let the sheep and goats and the cattle graze opposite that mountain. And Moses cut two stone tablets like the first ones, and he started early in the morning, and he went up to Mount Sinai, as Yahweh had commanded him, and he took in his hand the two stone tablets. And Yahweh descended in the cloud, and he stood with him there, and he proclaimed the name of Yahweh. And Yahweh passed over before him, and he proclaimed, Yahweh, God, who is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding with loyal love and faithfulness, keeping loyal love to the thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and he does not leave utterly unpunished, punishing the guilt of fathers on sons and on sons of sons on third and fourth generations. And Moses hurried and knelt down to the earth and worshipped. And he said, Please, if I have found favor in your eyes, Lord, let my Lord, please, go among us. Indeed, it is a stiff-necked people. And forgive our iniquity and our sin, and take us as your possession. And he said, Look, I am about to make a covenant. In front of all your people I will do wonders that have not been created on all the earth and among all the nations. And all the people among whom you are will see Yahweh's work, because what I am about to do with you will be awesome. Keep for yourself what I myself have commanded you today. Look, I am about to drive from before you the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Be careful for yourself, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land to which you are going, lest it be a snare among you. Rather, you will tear down their altars, and you will break their stone pillars, and you will cut off their Asherah poles. For you will not bow and worship to another god. For Yahweh is jealous as his name. He is a jealous god. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they prostitute themselves after their gods, and they sacrifice to their gods, and they invite you, and you eat their sacrifice, and you take from their daughters for your sons, and their daughters prostitute themselves after their gods, and they cause your sons to prostitute themselves after their gods. You will not make gods of cast metal for yourself. You will keep the feast of unleavened bread. Seven days you will eat unleavened bread, which I commanded you, at the appointed time of the month of Adam. For in the month of Adam you came out from Egypt. Every first offspring of the wound is for me, all of your male livestock, the first offspring of cattle and small livestock. But the first offspring of a donkey you will redeem with small livestock, and if you will not redeem it, you will break its neck. Every firstborn of your sons you will redeem, and you will not appear before me empty-handed. Six days you will work, and on the seventh day you will rest. In the time of plowing and in the time of harvest you will rest. And you yourself will observe the feast of weeks, the first fruits of the wheat harvest, and the feast of harvest gathering at the turn of the year. Three times in the year all your males will appear before the Lord, Yahweh, the God of Israel, because I will evict nations before you, and I will enlarge your territory, and no one will covet your land when you go up to appear before Yahweh your God three times in the year. You will not slaughter the blood of my sacrifice on food with yeast, and the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover will not stay overnight to the morning. The beginning of the first fruits of your land you will bring to the house of Yahweh your God. 
you will not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. And Yahweh said to Moses, Write for yourself these words, because according to these words I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. And he was there with Yahweh forty days and forty nights. He ate no food and drank no water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the ten words. And when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, the two tablets of the testimony were in the hand of Moses at his coming down from the mountain. And Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because of his speaking with him. And Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, and, to their amazement, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid of coming near to him. And Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the community returned to him, and Moses spoke to them. And afterward all the Israelites came near, and he commanded them all that Yahweh had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. And Moses finished speaking with them, and he put a veil on his face. And when Moses came before Yahweh to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he went out. And he would go out and would speak to the Israelites what he had been commanded. And the Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin of the face of Moses shone. And Moses would put back the veil on his face until his coming to speak with him. So it's an insight on chapter 34. I noticed something really interesting for the first time in my life. I noticed it and I couldn't find anyone else that noticed it. So I can't wait to get your thoughts about what I'm about to share with you. So the tablets of the covenant, Exodus 34, and Yahweh said to Moses, cut for yourself two stone tablets like the first ones. And I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, okay? So basically he's saying he's going to write those words. And be ready for the morning and go up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself to me there on the top of the mountain. And he said, look, I am about to make a covenant in front of all of your people. I will do wonders that have not been created and all the earth and on all the earth and among all the nations. And all the people among whom you are, you are will see Yahweh's work because what I am about to do with you will be awesome. And then I'm jumping a little bit and Yahweh said to Moses, write for yourself these words because according to these words I have met a covenant with you and with Israel. And he was there with Yahweh 40 days and 40 nights. He had no food and, and drank no water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the ten words or the Ten Commandments. Okay, so what did he actually write? Three chapters discuss the Tablets of the Covenant. Chapter 20 in Exodus, which we read a couple of weeks ago. Chapter 34 in Exodus, which we just read. And chapter 5 in Deuteronomy, where Moses recounting the story. And I found something interesting. In each one of them, there are 10 commandments, but actually the second tablets, which is this week, chapter 34, the 10 commandments look uh, actually different. So if I compare Exodus 20 to Deuteronomy 5, it's exact match. Moses is recounting the 10 commandments that were given originally in Exodus 20, the ones that he broke and shattered, okay? Almost identical. And I color coded it so you can see it for yourself. 10 commandments match Deuteronomy 5 and Exodus 20. However, this week chapter, we have 10 commandments that don't really match. We have only three matches. So the first commandment to do with the first commandment to do with I'm Yahweh or God, that's a match. The second commandment of not making other casting other gods, idols, basically, it's a match. And then the fifth, the fourth commandment in the first tablets matches the fifth commandment in the second tablets. It's about Shabbat. And then everything goes south from here. We don't have the rest of the commandments. So I'm missing seven of the commandments I'm missing. And instead, we got the commandment about the Feast of Unleavened Bread commandment about every first offspring of the womb belongs to Yahweh and then we have the feast of weeks and then the three pilgrimage feasts that they were supposed to go to the house of Yah and then a commandment about the Passover sacrifice 
and a commandment about the first fruits, to bringing the first fruits of the land. I don't know, I just, I was stunned that we actually have different Ten Commandments in the second tablet. What are the Ten Commandments, okay? Anyway. It's interesting you point that out because the tablets that are in the Ark are the second set. Exactly. <laughs> but Moses, when he recounted the commandments in Deuteronomy 5, he recounted the first ones. I just thought it's interesting that after Moses shatters them and after the golden calf incident, when he goes back for another 40 days, he gets another set, basically, of commandments. It blew my mind, and that's why I did this analysis to share with you. I want to point something out. Go back to the prior slide. And if you look at the verse 1, it says, Yael is going to write on the mm -hmm. tablets, right? And then you look at 28. Who's writing the tablets? Is it Yah? Mm -hmm. No. No, it's Moses. And then I, so I want to show you one more thing. The first tablet in chapter 20, it says, And all the people were seeing the thunder and the lightning and the sound of the ram's horn and the mountain smoking. And the people saw and they trembled and they stood at a distance. And they said to Moses, You speak with us and we will listen, but let not God speak with us lest we die. That's how the account of the Ten Commandments is concluded by these verses. Then in this week, in chapter 34, the account of the Ten Commandments is concluded with the following verse. And Yahweh said to Moses, write for yourself these words, because according to these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. So these are the Ten Commandments that signify the, the covenant that Yah has made with us. Yes. And then in chapter 5 of Deuteronomy, Moses concludes the Ten Commandments with the following verses. These words Yahweh spoke to your whole assembly at the mountain from the midst of the fire and the very thick cloud with a loud voice. So basically those what we just saw in chapter 20. And he did not add anything, and then he wrote them on two tablets of stone and gave them to me. So he wrote the original one. Yes. And then when you heard the voice from the midst of the darkness, and as the mountain was burning with fire, and all the heads of your tribes and your elder, blah, 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 blah. Right. Anyway, I was stunned to realize it, and I can't wait to hear what everyone else think about what I just shared. This is all I had to share on these chapters. I'm opening the floor for the last three chapters and I can't wait to get your insights. I'm going to leave these slides on in case anyone wants to comment on it. My initial thought on this is that the second tablets that were written, it says it's a covenant. So you have some of the commands in there and you have additional things that are put in place for us to follow as a covenant with him. Mm -hmm. So if we are walking with him, we are believing, we're trusting, we come into this covenant, then we are to do the things so that we, are on the second tablets. For so sure. we have to follow the three feasts. Yeah. Basically, it's part of the, it's not only Shabbat, but also the three pilgrimage feasts. Yeah, and the only challenge with the three feasts is that it is to go where his name is. And right now, yeah. that there is, yeah. there's no temple, there's no, yeah. no place to go. Yeah. But we are the temple, so my answer to that would be the fellowship with brothers and sisters alike. Yeah. Anyone has any thoughts? It was my understanding, I did a study years ago on the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, was my understanding from what I, I read and what I studied that there was actually two arcs. That Moses built one. And I think it was at Old Holy Abbot. What was it? I think I know who you're talking about. Bezalel? No, she oh. said Old Bezalel. Yeah. Bezalel. Bezalel. Yeah, and he was the one that created the one where all of Aaron's rod went into the manna and Moses' tablets. And the ones that were broken were put into the ark that Moses made. And that the, the ark kind of went out before the camp with the broken tablets in it that Moses made. Hmm. I can get you. I was looking, trying to find, I'm trying to find you the scriptures of where it said that Moses made the one ark. That's what stood out to me because it brought to me back about 
that study that I did, because I was really surprised when I read it that it said that Moses actually made an ark. And I'm like, wow, that's really interesting that he made an ark. And that's just from my understanding, that's where the two broken tablets went to. Because it never talks about the tablets after that. Exactly. Um, about, yeah, and I mean, they would have been pretty significant. They're not just going to throw them away because it was the finger of Yah that, yes, that broke them. Right. And, yeah, and, and they, to me, would have been quite holy. But yeah, I will try and find those scriptures for you to, so you can browse for yourself and maybe you can look into that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, as well. The other one that I had was the ornaments. I've always been quite curious about what the ornaments were on that they took off. I, right. I've always pondered on that. I don't know if you guys know anything yeah. about that. Yeah, me too. I've thought about that myself. And it, it, it's sad because they took them off and I don't recall them ever putting them back on when reading it. And I would think that they were given these vestments or these robes or whatever this was these articles of clothing Jeez. of ornaments to wear is that they were they either made these as a representation or a kind of a how would you say a like a tribe of people would wear something that is common to them it was something to that effect where they were representatives of Yahweh and so they more or less took these off that's how I understood it but there's not a whole lot written about this that was good. I really thought it was really brilliant about when you said they've been a drink, about drinking the, the, the gold. gold melted down because yes. I, how I always interpreted that scripture, and I'm actually completely leaning towards what you said now because I always interpreted that scripture as it reminded me of like Yahushua when he was saying, Take this wine, like this is my blood. Because when you melt down gold, it turns red. And I, I often thought that maybe that was like a symbology thing. But now I'm throwing that out the window. <laughs> That's what you said. Yeah. Because I thought that was so brilliant. That, uh, no, yes. And it makes a lot of sense after you had read yeah, after you read that, I just that blew my mind. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Yeah, it, yes. it always intrigued me. Like, how did he? How did they know which people to kill? Yeah, <laughs> yeah just went out and slaughtered three thousand. He must have really been watching who was there doing the golden calf thing. But yeah, when I was doing my research and making the the connections, and I came across the dust, and I thought, wow, this totally makes sense on how they could distinguish the people because it was idolatry, which was adultery. And it was done in a similar fashion where Moses took and ground the dust and had them drink it. So it, yeah, it totally made sense to me. So I wanted to present that. So thank you. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah, that, that, that was so good. And my only other thing that I was taking note on it, I've always been quite curious of why Aaron was never really punished that. I, I heard what you said about that Aaron probably was fearing for his life. And I thought that was really a really good point he had said that because Aaron admitted he because he had said like here this is your god that brought you out of Egypt yep. and that he wasn't punished in any way for doing that because he was supposed to be like like number two guy from Moses I guess yep. and, and eventually become the high priest I always was pondered that and thought that was quite curious yes yeah, so, so I would like to share some of my thoughts I just didn't I didn't think I will have enough time to share more slides so that's why I didn't do anything about it so let me just spontaneously share a few thoughts so both of them were the leaders but they were a totally different styles of leaders Moses was more the stern leader and Aaron was more the compassionate soft leader totally two different leaders and what happened is when Moses was gone on the 40 days and I think they didn't count it correctly or something maybe but right on the day before he was supposed to come back they decided that something happened to him and when they came to Aaron and my understanding is from reading some interpretations is that there were two factions and one faction was a, a very strong faction that Aaron knew that if he will refuse to work with them they will completely sway the people in the wrong direction so I think what Aaron was doing Aaron was buying times okay so he asked them to donate all of their jewelry and they thought that maybe they will not and then they did 
So now he was like wasting time to buy times because he knew that Moses is supposed to come down any moment. And I think it didn't work. His solution didn't work of buying time and wasting time because ended up that they got the calf before Moses came back. And then the second thing is that he didn't say, this are your God, Israel. It's not him. If you go back and read it, he presented them with the calf and they say, here are your gods, Israel. They told themselves, right? But then Aaron, to salvage the situation, said, tomorrow we are going to have a feast for Yahweh. So he was trying to, again, bring them back to Yahweh, away from this idol. So I think it, the, the story is way more complicated, and, and that's why he wasn't punished sternly at that moment. Uh, But he was punished by dying ahead of them arriving in the promised land. Yeah, okay, yeah, that was a good explanation. Yeah, I recall it was somewhere in Deuteronomy, and it's not coming to me, about it's in either in Deuteronomy or it's in Psalms where it talks about Aaron being punished for what he did with the golden calf. It's, I I know it's, there's a scripture on it, I just can't, I can't think of it. Yeah, but him dying ahead of time, that was his punishment. Yeah. Yeah. I just don't know the address. Okay. I found the scripture of where Moses made the other ark of Acacia wood. It's in Deuteronomy 10, 1, 5. So it says, And at that time, Yahweh said to me, Cut out for yourself two tablets of stone like the first two, and come up to me on a mountain and make an ark of wood for yourself. Then I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you smashed to pieces, and you shall put them in the ark. So I made an ark of acacia wood and cut out the two tablets of stone like the first two. And I went up on a mountain and the two tablets in my hand. So he's saying that, so I made an an ark of acacia wood. Oh, wow. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And so that's where I believe that the two broken tablets were put in this one that Moses made. Mm. It just said of acacia wood. Yes, not really. It's just food for thought. Yeah. Yeah. Good. A lot of food for thought in these few chapters. Uh, They were amazing. Let me just close by showing the variant diggers, hardly no variants between the Dead Sea Scrolls, Masoretic, and, and Septuagint. Mostly in the Septuagint, the differences are to do with the copier. I don't even know. Maybe the Greek is correct and the English translation of the Greek Septuagint is incorrect by saying prawns or brass. Other than that, no variant between the manuscripts. And uh, we are done for today. All right. Father Yah, we thank you for this time that you've given us, that we can share your words, what you have inspired us to share. May it be a joy. May it be helpful. May it be encouraging to others for them to dig deeper into your words, to better understand you and your ways, and to follow your ways and to do them obediently with love, humility, and peace. We ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Thank you, everyone.